Hello, good afternoon, and uh, welcome to this program. Uh, we are glad today to talk about a very interesting book that uh, uh, shed a light on the development of music in the last, uh, we may say, 150 years or, or more. And uh, it would be a very interesting conversation with the author of the book, that is uh, Dr. E. Michael Jones. The book is Dionysos Rising. Uh, Dr. E. Michael Jones is the editor of uh, Culture Wars uh, and uh, also is author of many, many books, uh, uh, very interesting books, uh, not uh, for me and, uh, and the other guests, uh, not many translated in Italian. Uh, so I want to welcome uh, Dr. E. Michael Jones. Thank you. Thank you, Aurelio. Good to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also, I am very glad to be joined by Dr. Mario Iannacone, that is uh, uh, Italian uh, apologist and author, and also something that I think is very interesting, because uh, I, I have to say the story. So uh, I call him uh, a few weeks ago, and I say, oh, you know, I was thinking about you because uh, I am reading a book by... Uh, Dr. E. Michael Jones about music, and I think you would be a good person to talk. And he told me, oh, but you know, I am the one that translated that book in Italian. So it was really by uh, by chance that uh, I learned that indeed he is the translator of yeah. uh, this uh, book uh, in Italian, and uh, it was published, I think, 10 years ago, no, here in Italy? Uh, no, more, I think, I think uh, uh, 13 years ago. Or yeah, 13 years ago by FDF uh, uh, Edizioni. So, yeah. uh, yes, so I, I, I was very curious about this book. And uh, I, I want to show you also uh, the image of the cover in English, the Dionysus Rising. Uh, you can find it on the uh, fidelitypress.org website, as you can find the new books by Dr. E. Michael Jones, like the last one, that is this one, you can see it in the right part of the page, Logos Rising, A History of Ultimate Reality. And then maybe we will say something also about this uh, with Dr. E. Michael Jones. Uh, before uh, we go into the topic of this uh, uh, of this. Uh, program I, I want to show you these are our uh, youtube channel please subscribe uh, aurelio Vorfir is my personal channel where you can find all my compositions that are uh, that have a video recording then ritorna itaca is another channel uh, with almost 1000 uh, 1000 members and then we have this one chorus master that is uh, devoted to speaking about music for the English audiences. Then we have in Facebook several groups, a Facebook Association of Choral Conductors, Music and Education Academy, Musicologia, Theologia, Liturgia and Musica Sagra. Uh, most of this group have thousands also of followers and we are also broadcasting in these groups. So please join if you didn't do it yet. And then there is my fan page, Aurelio Porfiri, that is also broadcasting live this program. If you want to be updated about all the program we are doing, please join my Telegram channel, uh, Aurelio Porfiri, you can find me there. You just write my name. And I want to remind you uh, that on Monday, we have another very interesting program here, How Musical is the Child, Music in Early Childhood. Uh, very interesting with very nice guests from Australia, Canada and Lithuania that will join me in discussing about this very important topic, how it's uh, possible to teach uh, kids to appreciate and learn music. Now, uh, Dr. E. Michael Jones, I want to tell you that uh, I really appreciate your book. Uh, I am a musician, first of all, you know, so I read it with the eyes of a musician and with the understanding of a musician. Of course, I don't maybe share everything you say, but this is what I want to discuss today uh, uh, about. But I think it's a very interesting book that, uh, uh, you know, as a sort of uh, exposition of the design of the development of modern music in the last uh, century or two centuries. And I want to ask you first, before I go into the specific parts, 
why you have the desire to write a book about music? Well, I began by writing a series of articles uh, in Fidelity magazine, which then became Culture Wars magazine, about modern figures. And the, the, uh, the goal here was to try and find out what, what was the real uh, essence, what was the hidden grammar of modernity. And so uh, the first book I wrote was called Degenerate Moderns, uh, uh, sexual, uh, some, <laughs> I've forgotten the subtitle of it, but uh, uh, basically modernity as rationalized sexual misbehavior. So the, 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 the thing that I got gleaned from all of these biographies was uh, either you uh, subject uh, your mind uh, to the truth or you subject the truth to your mind. Uh, and those people who subjected the truth to their mind uh, made their biographies very important because it was the only way you could really understand what they were doing by understanding their biography. If, if a person tells the truth, well, then the mind is irrelevant because it's simply uh, the mind becomes a window to the truth. But if you're suppressing the truth, then the mind becomes very important. And so I started off with a number of modern figures. One of the most uh, significant was Sigmund Freud. There's a long chapter on Sigmund Freud and the development of the Oedipus complex uh, in Degenerate Moderns. After these, after these articles appeared in serial fashion in Culture Wars magazine, uh, one of my readers came to me. Actually, it was Anne Rosh Muggeridge, a Canadian writer, who came to me and said, why don't you do something on music? And I thought, okay, I'll do something on music. That seems simple enough. Uh, I'll go to Schoenberg. Uh, and I realized as soon as I got involved in Schoenberg that I, it was not that simple, that you really could not understand Schoenberg on his own terms. Because to under, understand Schoenberg, you had to understand Verklär to Nacht. And when you looked into Verklär to Nacht, it was, uh, as the two people who were his contemporaries said, it was a smeared version of Tristan und Isolde. So that meant that you had to go back to Wagner to understand the rise of modern music. And that's, that's how I ended up starting off with that book. That's how but, I got started. But uh, indeed, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, um, it's quite interesting that you uh, started with Wagner because certainly this is a composer that is uh, uh, paramount, very important, but is uh, also not uh, just to be taken by himself because he's the product of all the romantic uh, time and the romantic development, even Beethoven and other of the kind. So don't you think that there is a time where there start this movement of music uh, that is going far from its uh, natural principles, as I think you, you say. There is one part of the book uh, that I, uh, you say, music is the antithesis of anarchy. You say, so music is where you uh, reveal the existence of a natural propension to uh, learn the order of nature. So don't you think that we can... Uh, uh, really uh, maybe uh, take the romantic time as the starting point of this kind of departure from nature? Yes and no. Mm. Uh, let's, let's take uh, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony as an example. Mm. I think this is clearly a piece of what you would call revolutionary move, uh, music. Uh, the Third Symphony was influenced by Napoleon Bonaparte. The Fifth Symphony is a revolutionary piece of music. But how is it different than, than Wagner? Well, the difference is that, you know, Beethoven just uh, unleashes this revolutionary energy in his music and the, 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 the energy becomes more and more intense. But at the end, he comes back to the, to the, to the key that he started off in. And so there's, in a sense, a, a logos. This is not a word I used back then. It's my, it's my favorite word now. But there is a logos to music and he returned to the order. He returned to the social order. And so in that sense, he was not a real revolutionary because a real revolutionary wants to overturn the social order. But you, so sorry. The, the, the difference is that when, when let, let's, let's back up here. Wagner was a revolutionary. Okay, there, there's no question about it. He took part in the revolution of 1848. 
The revolution of 1848 was a revolution against capitalism, not against the Ancien regime. The revolution failed. Uh, uh, Wagner had to get out of town uh, in, a, in a hurry. And so he went to Switzerland. And in Switzerland, he meditated on the failure of the revolution of 1848. And I'm saying he came up with two answers uh, to that failure. What I didn't cover at the time uh, was Das Rheingold. Das Rheingold is a meditation on capitalism. It is the most brilliant understanding of uh, the deep grammar, the hidden grammar of capitalism that has ever made it into a work of art, in my, in my humble opinion. I think that's, that's what Das Rheingold is. It's part of the ring cycle, and it got lost at the end, but the, Das Rheingold is brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant, especially if you compare it to something like Tolkien, for example. Tolkien was obviously influenced by Wagner's ring cycle. The Lord of the Rings is about that. He didn't like to say that, but that's clearly what was going on. Now, you can meditate on the Lord of the Rings and try and figure what, what that symbol means, and you'll never come to an answer because it's too confusing. He's too conflicted to come up with an honest answer. If you meditate on Das Rheingold, it's clear within five minutes that the ring is capitalism and it's made out of gold and the gold was stolen from the German people and Alberich is the man who did the theft and Alberich is a Jew and Alberich is a representative of the Rothschild family. It's a brilliant analysis. That's one aspect of what we're talking about here. That is the successful analysis of the revolution. Now, the other part of it is Wagner did not cease to be a revolutionary after 1848. But I think he understood at this point that political revolution was no longer possible. And at that point, I think he turned to sexual revolution as the outlet for his revolutionary feelings. And that brings us to Tristan and Isolde. But uh, I want to, um, uh, not, not, not to, how to say, to, to say that I, I don't agree on the overall, but uh, you identify the social order with tonality, basically, is what I understand from your book. Uh, but still, uh, Wagner does that. Wagner says melody and Metternich are the same thing. Yes, but melody can be also, uh, you know, in uh, in Renaissance music, they don't use tonality, but you use, they use modality, but still there was a, a very order kind of music. But uh, also you mentioned in your book that uh, uh, there is a contrast uh, between music and the tempest. Uh, you you, you uh, mentioned about Shakespeare, you know, and you say uh, basically the, the difference between uh, Apollinian and Dionysiac uh, uh, music, you know. So uh, what I mean is that I think this kind of movement probably um, was uh, more strong, stronger in a romantic time, but still was very well like a Karsik river, you, you say in English, Karsik river, uh, was very well uh, alive also uh, from uh, the 16th century or 17th century with the humanism uh, and uh, with, with uh, you know, uh, uh, philosophical movement uh, like this. Uh, wh what do you think? Yes, there was a, 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 a repudiation of uh, Catholicism began in, in Florence in the 15th century. It was, it was uh, Cosimo de' Medici mm. uh, at the Council of Florence who basically brought uh, George Gamistos who was a, uh, the, the uh, custodian of the hermetic tradition in Constantinople, brought him into contact with uh, Ficino and basically told Ficino to trans these, mag these texts of magic uh, into Latin. And that was, that, was the, uh, that was the beginning, the re entrance of paganism into the resurgence of paganism in Europe for the first time. And the Medici were the people who did it. And the best, uh, the best uh, graphic example would be Botticelli's Primavera. Okay, the man, uh, this is, uh, Florence is the city of flowers. 
That's the woman. You can see the springtime on the right-hand side of the picture. The figure on the left-hand side of the picture is Lorenzo de Medici. He's got a, a, a rod and he's stirring the clouds. This is the man who has the magic now, and he's going to reintroduce paganism. It's Florence is the springtime of paganism. It's been reintroduced, and then it takes root and it develops. Okay, It takes a while for it to get to Germany, but I think this is where it began. This this re revolution, this rebellion against the Catholic Christian order in Europe. Mm. Uh, I don't know if uh, Dr. Yanakone want to add anything about what we have said until now. Well, uh, I can say uh, something. Uh, uh, I, uh, I many years ago I was uh, searching uh, uh, the, the secret fuel of. Uh, cultural revolution that uh, I was uh, studying uh, in, in Europe. And so I, I stumbled on this book. And in this book, uh, uh, Michael Jones tells us, uh, tell us that Wagner with uh, his uh, Tristan and Isolde uh, displayed uh, uh, either melody or emotions, either logos or anti-logos and that Wagner, uh, read by Nietzsche, uh, could uh, uh, subordinate the music to the logic of uh, uh, desires through chromatic modulation. I am not uh, a musician, so I, 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 was, uh, uh, I, I must say that I was impressed by uh, this explanation. Um, and... Uh, uh, it, uh, uh, I, I was uh, uh, impressed uh, by the fact that uh, uh, probably Wagner was the seed uh, that uh, uh, planted uh, uh, this kind of, uh, of a revolution. Um, uh, Jones uh, uh, wrote that the diatonic scale uh, could arouse emotions and, uh, and subdue them to reason. And this uh, was the system that created the, the wonderful explosion of uh, musical uh, creativity in Europe uh, during uh, uh, Renaissance and Baroque and, um, and beyond. But uh, the prize of admission was the rigor of uh, um, tonal diatonic system, uh, because uh, this uh, system um, has a uh, beginning, a middle part, uh, and an ending. And so uh, it can uh, evoke emotion, emotions which end in a catharsis. And this is uh, the, the reason, the, the, the part that uh, I found so uh, impressive. Um, the price to pay is to accept the regulation of, uh, of reason. And uh, I think that the same that happened to music, uh, the beginning was Wagner, but then the, the story was very, very, very uh, complex, uh, has happened or is happening uh, to most uh, forms of mass literature and art, uh, like, for example, the, the cinema, the TV series, the uh, entertainment shows, um, for example, I, 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 I try to make an example. Till the 80s, we had uh, horror and thriller movies in which at the end, the monster or the menace or the, the villain uh, were destroyed by the forces of logos upon, uh, of reason. Uh, in other words, the villain was destroyed and there were a, a catharsis. There was a catharsis in most, uh, in most uh, um, part of these uh, uh, movies and uh, these uh, uh, novels also. And we felt freed and liberated from, uh, from evil. Uh, today, the catharsis uh, does not uh, happen, not no more, or is not allowed. To, 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 to happen. And I think that this is the same as in music. Most part of uh, uh, pop, rap, and trap music and modern music uh, in our days have uh, only a hypnotic function, 
uh, that is the, the negation negation of, uh, of logos uh, uh, using uh, the, the keywords of uh, that uh, Michael E. Michael Jones uh, uh, uses. Um, and Wagner probably was the be beginning of uh, this uh, uh, revolution. Not only him, but he was uh, uh, the king of, so of of cultural revolutionaries of uh, uh, Europe uh, in fin de siècle in, in Paris and in London. They they uh, loved uh, uh, Wagner, uh, and so. I, I was impressed by, by this book and by uh, this uh, explanation uh, for these reasons. And I, I think that um, I am, uh, uh, well, yes. I'm, I'm uh, also in, in this idea. Uh, if I may add something before, uh, then I give you the... Uh, indeed, I think uh, we, we should be a little more specific because in the book of uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Jones, uh, it says that uh, in a certain moment, Wagner has to choose between uh, the melody and the emotion uh, or something like this. But indeed, uh, uh, that is not a choice because uh, every uh, melody is in any case uh, imbued with emotions. But uh, I think what it means is that emotion without the logos. Because I can see that in the thinking of Dr. E. Michael Jones uh, is very central the the idea of the return to order. No, so that there is this idea that always come uh, the return to order or the or the disorder. This fight between order and disorder. So uh, I think that uh, uh, it's a very important to understand that uh, uh, of course uh, all kind of music, even the most uh, uh, Apollinean. Uh, it is imbued with emotions, but there is the logos, you know, the the the, the order that still is uh, uh, on top of the, of everything. So uh, what I think uh, is the we may say accusation. Even if I can see that uh, Dr. E. Michael Jones, as also myself, I have to tell you frankly, I also think Wagner is a great musician. He's a genius uh, for for music, even if is not my favorite. I mean, I'm Italian, so I listen more to uh, Verdi or this kind of composer, but I can recognize he's a genius. But he, uh, he is the leading force to, uh, you maybe want to say, to bring disorder inside music. This is correct to say? Yes. I think, I think if we take a step back, we mm -hmm. can see the struggle that was going on in Wagner's mind. And I'm referring here to Tannhäuser. Now, uh, Tannhäuser has one of the strongest melodies that uh, in the history of Western music. It's the Pilgrim's Chorus, just a powerful melody. But it's contextualized by the conflict in Tannhäuser uh, because that's the, the pilgrims are going to Rome, but uh, he's tempted to stay in the Venusberg, uh, where, which is the realm of, of lust and uh, anti-logos. Uh, and when he's in the Venusberg, this is, I think it's the Paris version of Tristan and Isolde. That's chromatic. Uh, the Pilgrim Chorus is diatonic. And what we're seeing here is, do you want to, do you want to uh, raise the emotion uh, and then return to order with some type of catharsis? Or do you just want to keep uh, raising the emotion and extending the emotion uh, further and further and further? And I think that's what happens with, with Tristan. You sail off and you never come back again. This is the problem with the, uh, the chromatic scale as opposed to the diatonic scale, which always has a beginning, a middle, and an end. You don't have that resolution in Tristan. And I think this is how it became. There's nothing intrinsically sexual about the chromatic scale, but his use of the chromatic scale is... It becomes an instrument of sexual liberation in Tristan, because basically what he's saying is, I want no order to my emotion. I want darkness. O zinc hernida, nach der Liebe. This is adultery. I'm choosing adultery, which is an irrational form of sexual behavior. And I'm going to give the best expression of that adulterous emotion that I can. And that's why he's using the, the chromatic scale. And indeed, uh, I, I can feel this. Uh, this uh, there is this sort of red line of the 
sexuality that uh, you basically use for the for in the whole book. Uh, so the, this about this idea, and in one part of the book, uh, you say uh, something like uh, uh, that uh, there is opposition between love and eros, and the darkness is the kingdom of erotism that, for its its nature, uh, um, uh, imply the blind acting of the instinct. Uh, right. You you say so. You uh, basically uh, uh, use this. Uh, I uh, I find it also quite uh, interesting because uh, um, uh, you. Uh, it seems to me that you read everything under the um, the lens of the sexual sexualization. Okay, I, it's I don't know if it's a wrong impression. Uh, I was very interested in sex at that time. Uh, maybe it was being uh, 30 years younger. Maybe that had something to do with it. But uh, I, I, I was coming to, I was trying to come to some type of understanding, first of all, of my particular situation in life. How could I get fired from a Catholic college for opposing abortion? And then I had the sense that there was this sexual corruption that had taken place in Catholic universities throughout the United States. And there was a sexual corruption throughout the United States. And this eventually led me to the book uh, called Libido Dominandi, Sexual Liberation and Political Control, which mm. I, where I finally came to the conclusion that all of this sexual liberation was promoted as a form of control and that that was the control mechanism in the United States at this time. This was the beginning of it. OK, this was the beginning and trying to see there is a natural order and there's a total totalitarian order that gets imposed when the natural order disappears. And if you are going to prolong this uh, sexual experience beyond the bounds of reason, then that is the type of uh, music that uh, Wagner was promoting at this time. And I'm, I'm also saying I think that was the way it was perceived. In Germany, certainly, at the end of the 19th century, if you read uh, someone like Thomas Mann, mm. Thomas Mann went to every performance of Tristan that he could that he could do, that he could go mm. to. Mm. Uh, it comes out, it, his understanding of both Tristan and Nietzsche comes out in uh, Toten Venedig, in Death in Venice, where he basically makes that choice. He chooses to die. He chooses to follow that sexual liberation to its logical conclusion, which is death, by staying in Venice when the plague is coming there. He violates reason to the point of even choosing death. This is the the uh, this is what I think is the fruit of uh, Wagner's Tristan. And indeed, uh, I think in all your book, basically, is uh, it can be seen that uh, um, uh, you oppose. Two kind of uh, um, of uh, uh, we may say uh, atmosphere. There is the atmosphere created by the Christian order, and then there is the the environment uh, created by everything that opposes to Christian order. And of course, in your book, you deal with uh, uh, speaking about music with all these people that, uh, uh, according to your opinion, uh, uh, well informed opinion were leading music astray but uh, of course uh, there will be uh, an, uh, to to do another book and maybe you write it already about explaining why uh, you know my my point is not only people want to go far from christian order but don't you have the impression also that christianity christianity itself in the last we may say one century and something uh, in a certain way, weakened, you know, become more vulnerable. Uh, don't you feel that this is also maybe a theme? It's not only the people opposing Christianity, but it's also Christianity. Indeed, in, in I think also Nietzsche, you know, this is one of the accusations Nietzsche, you know, say, oh, Christianity is a religion that uh, make people weaker. It's not, it's not a, the religion of the strong people. Don't you think that also there is something inside Christianity that uh, make it more vulner vulnerable? No, no, I don't. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I think that what happened over this period of time is that sexual liberation, beginning with someone like Wagner, got weaponized. It got mm -hmm. weaponized, which meant it became an explicit tool of subverting Christianity, a, a, a tool, the best tool uh, ever invented to weaken Christianity. And mm -hmm. the man who was responsible for that was Wilhelm Reich, uh, a communist, a Freudian, a Jew from Vienna, who uh, basically understood that if you promoted uh, sexual liberation, he's the father, of, by the way, of the term sexual liberation. OK, mm -hmm. if you promote this among Catholics, the idea of God will simply evaporate from their minds. He mentioned seminarians in particular, and this became weaponized over this period of time. So, no, I don't think it was a weakness within Christianity. I think that the weakness in Christianity, the, in Christian culture that swept through Europe during this period of time was the result of a concerted effort by a certain group of people to destroy the morals of the population. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Giannacone, you want to add something? Well, uh, yes. Uh, um, thinking uh, like a, a, an historian, uh, I, I can say that uh, it is true that uh, Wagner was uh, considered uh, the king, the leader of the new spiritualism, uh, of the symbolist uh, era, of the avant-garde of spiritualists that uh, in most part were agnostic, exoterists and sexual revolutionaries, like the Bloomsburys, the people that went to Ascona or that, that uh, um, uh, were in uh, uh, Schwabing, Monaco uh, uh, and, uh, and Paris. So, uh, yes, uh, the revolution uh, was uh, um, beginning, uh, the, the beginning of the, the, the last part of the revolution, or the cultural revolution, uh, was, uh, um, was made in part uh, also uh, by Wagner. Wagner was a genius, we know. Uh, but uh, he was uh, the uh, background music. He, he gave the background music for these people, and they adored him. Uh, he was a, uh, a leader. Oh, uh, yes. An yeah. idol, really. It, An it, idol. it was idolized. Uh, oh, yeah. Yes, really. Because... And, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, go on. No, 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 no. Well, I think because, uh, well, he could... Uh, uh, Gave he 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 gave uh, um, uh, sensual emotions uh, that uh, that were unchecked uh, by by the laws of logos. So uh, yes, uh, Nietzsche uh, knew it uh, well. No, indeed, that, that, that's very interesting, and I I want the comment of uh, uh, Dr. Jones about uh, uh, what I'm going to say. Uh, because uh, I remember many, many years ago when uh, uh, I was really adolescent and we, in our parish, we have a, a, a philosophy professor and he was a former priest. He was an ex-priest, a very, very Catholic. And he, uh, you know, he liked uh, to teach us about philosophy. So he make us aware about, and when he talk about Nietzsche, he always say, Oh, yes, this is very dangerous, but indeed he say almost with admiration because he, he say, I don't know if in English it, it sounds correct what I'm going to say, but he said that Nietzsche was like a mystic, but upside down. Uh, so it, it was uh, like a very deep, uh, deep thinking. But uh, uh, and I think in your book, you say something similar. You say uh, uh, that he doesn't want to eliminate order but to oppose it completely to 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 something like this uh, what what you can say about uh, nietzsche that is one of the big we may say apostle or of, of wagner at least until a certain point when he then rebelled because he thought that right. wagner was returning to a sort right. of christianity right he he broke with wagner when wagner uh, wrote parsifal yeah because Parsifal was a, a homage to Christianity, to the Eucharist, more, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. it was very devout music, reverent music. Yeah. But the, the, the lesson that Nietzsche derived from Tristan and Isolde was the birth of tragedy. Uh, his yeah. first book, it ruined his reputation as a professor in Germany, and then it sent him off on that career, which was basically the, the apostle of anti-Logos, 
Mm-hmm. He hated Logos. He, he hated, he, he used to, uh, he hated, he, he referred to it as Christ Socrates. He made no distinction between Christ and Socrates. And he's right. He's right. Because the Logos is what unites Christ and Socrates. And he hated that order. And he saw in Wagner the vehicle that could overturn that order in Christian Europe. And I, I think he was right. He was right. Now, we could add in the whole story of uh, syphilis. Uh, because I think that he deliberately contracted syphilis. This is Thomas Mann believes that that is the premise of his book, Dr. Faustus, because it had some type of when syphilis goes to the brain, you have this sense of complete transcendence and then your brain burns out and then you be go, go insane. And this is something very similar to, to Nietzsche's later years. He had this incredible intellectual output at the end of his life and then he went insane. Uh, I think that uh, there was probably some truth to this. But he saw Wagner as the vehicle. I, I don't think there's any question. And it, he he was it, we, he was led according to the story from Peter Gast, which Thomas Mann believed. He was so inspired by the piano score of Tristan and Isolde that he deliberately infected himself with syphilis so that he could have that type of irrevocable commitment to sexual liberation. That's what syphilis meant at that period in time. And I think also a, a, an important role also on between uh, Wagner and Nietzsche, it, it is also the role of Schopenhauer, uh, because uh, his uh, philosophy of the will, you know, I, I can do whatever I want, uh, say it very simply, I think it's very important. Well, it's it goes back farther than that, because it goes back to William of Ockham. There's a whole chapter on William of Ockham in Logos Rising, uh, where basically almost within 90 years of his death, the, the synthesis of faith and reason that Thomas Aquinas created fell apart, and it fell apart most seriously in Germany. And so you had uh, the will disconnected from the intellect, and the will becomes piety, and the intellect becomes science, and you end up with those two parallel tracks. And, and the fruit of this is Luther. Uh, Luther is basically a man who hated Logos every bit as much as Nietzsche hated Logos. And it's no coincidence that Nietzsche, is the, his father, was a Lutheran pastor. Nietzsche is, in many ways, the culmination of Lutheranism, because you have this will as the ultimate reality. And uh, an intermediary step was, was uh, of course, uh, Schopenhauer. Die Welt aus Wille und Vorstellung. Uh, was an influence, but I see it in a bigger way as Luther as the culmination of uh, nominalism and Occam's basically division of faith and reason. Uh, one thing you you mentioned uh, several times is that uh, I, I'm looking here. You say that according to Nietzsche, that uh, was also musically gifted. A complete dissonance is the better is the best tool to determine the cultural change that he so wishes. Uh, but it, 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 we have to say something because, of course, dissonance is part of music. Every kind of music is uh, as dissonance. Uh, Bach, Mozart, everything. But uh, what we are talking is the emancipation of dissonance. So basically, dissonance that is no more considered dissonant, but is considered normal. Uh, what I want to say, uh, and uh, I don't think you speak about this in the book. At least I don't remember uh, to the, I read about this is that also we have other composers uh, later on uh, that uh, will not accept this development that was uh, uh, instigated by, according to your uh, opinion, by Wagner, and then brought forward uh, from Schoenberg and, and so on. For example, we have uh, all the French school, uh, like Debussy, Ravel, and uh, these other composers, and they also, use dissonance in a very free way but they don't uh they still uh how to say they still have a, a certain idea of order inside the, the their music is not uh, like uh, anarchic in the sense that uh, we may say is uh, uh like uh, dodecaphony uh, or other kind of music you didn't think uh, i think uh, about uh, you didn't write about uh, Debussy or Abel, or I'm wrong. No, no, no. I, I mean, I, you're right. There's no, there's no music without dissonance. But the question is, what role does dissonance play? 
is, yeah, is exactly. this, does dissonance triumph? Or is dissonance something that happens along the way to a final resolution and harmony? Yes. Those are the two worldviews that, that we're talking about here. And Nietzsche uh, wanted, uh, said that there was nothing but dissonance. There was no harmony. There was no overarching order. There, if there's no overarching order, there's no logos. And if there's no logos, there's no way to reconcile all of these dissonances in some type of uh, 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 harmonious order. end. Or order. harmonious order. This was a rejection of the ending. Not so. It's like saying, "Well, can you? Uh, what's? Uh, what about black? Is black a bad color? Uh, you should never use black in your painting. There should be never be shadows in your painting. No, of course not. That's that's ridiculous. But this is the ideology of blackness, or the ideology of dissonance that is basically triumphing over any type of logos in music. And I think but it found it found its culmination. In Schoenberg and twelve tone music, that was yeah, many we, we, we will talk about yeah we will talk about this uh, uh, soon. Uh, I just want to ask you one thing: when you write, uh, especially when you write about uh, Wagner and Nietzsche, okay, not so much about Schoenberg and uh, the modern uh, rock music, but when you write about these two, I feel there is a, a kind of, uh, in a case of uh, admiration. From your side, uh, this is is a wrong impression, or uh, or um, or there is some kind of yes. You say they are very dangerous, but you recognize their their intellectual stature. Or, or I'm wrong. Well, for, first of all, uh, Wagner is a genius when it comes to music, and yeah. I didn't recognize his full genius until I wrote about uh, Das Rheingold and, and capitalism. That's in my book, Baron Metal. There's a whole chapter on Das Rheingold, which is, that's mm -hmm. a, a history of capitalism as the conflict between labor and usury. So I've always recognized Wagner's genius. I do not like Tristan on his old. I think Tannhäuser is a great opera. I love, yeah. I like listening to Tannhäuser. I do not enjoy listening to Tristan on his old. It's mm -hmm. so, but it's not just, uh, I'm not going to reduce it to simply a matter of taste here. Okay. Mm -hmm. When it comes to Nietzsche, Uh, I can recognize him as a master of German prose. And, and you can see uh, that Wagner, I'm sorry, Thomas Mann was inspired by Nietzsche's prose because there's a passage about the Dionysian festival in uh, Death in Venice that is, I think, one of the greatest passages in the German language ever written. And, and it comes uh, straight from Nietzsche. So I can recognize that. But, I mean, he was, he was a wicked man. I mean, he, he was basically the architect of the downfall of Europe. And, and that's not something that I admire. Yeah, of course. And, and um, I want to ask something to uh, Dr. Yanacone. Uh, before, uh, you know, you, you are very well known uh, for your books on uh, apologetics and uh, all your work uh, that is really admirable. Uh, and uh, I'm thinking you know, that uh, we are now... Uh, Uh, near the beginning of the 20th century, now, especially with Schoenberg, that now, now we are going to talk. And uh, uh, for Catholics, you know, that is the time also of the modernism, uh, all, all of the... So don't, don't you think that uh, also the modernism, uh, uh, this is something that, uh, you know, in a certain way uh, has weakened uh, the, the, yes. the Catholic side uh, and, uh, you know, give the chance of this movement to, to, to improve and improve more? What do you think? Well, yes, uh, there is a parallelism uh, uh, between uh, uh, modernism, uh, French modernism, English modernism, Italian modernism, and uh, uh, Wagner, uh, because uh, Alfred Loisi or uh, uh, the Italian modernists uh, were Wagnerian. Mm. They went to Bayreuth. So, yes, uh, there is a, a, a link uh, that is very clear and, uh, um, and uh, uh, the same uh, we uh, could say about uh, um, uh, art, uh, painting uh, or novel. We had uh, in, in, in Italy the, um, the great, greater or the most uh, read uh, a uh, novelist uh, in the uh, first part of the 20th uh, century was uh, Fogazzaro, uh, mm -hmm. author of uh, Piccolo Mondo Antico, mm -hmm. and he was a Wagnerian, 
and uh, uh, he was also uh, in, in some way uh, uh, a, a sexual revolutionary. But you, you, you know that in the time, you know, if, if you want to be considered a follower of the music of the future, you have to be Wagnerian, no? because uh, the, the music like of Italia Opera, uh, it was considered the reactionary, not the reaction. The, yes. you, are, you were old, uh, so that, that, is, uh, uh, that was the, the kind of uh, climax they were living. So uh, please go on. Yes. Oh, well, this is uh, all uh, for, for, for the moment. I, you, you can ask uh, to something to Michael Jones. I, I have, a, I have a, a parallel example here, yes. also with Italian. The, 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 probably the greatest portrait artist of the 20th century was Pietro Anagoni from, from Florence. Yes. Uh, his, yes. His portrait of Queen Elizabeth II is one of the greatest portraits in the history of painting. For me okay? too. In in 1947, he held an exhibition and no one came to his exhibition yeah. because yeah. everybody was enthralled with Jackson Pollock. You are right. Jackson Pollock was the man in 1947. And he wrote uh, he I wrote mean, a, 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 an anti-modernist manifesto to go with his painting and nobody paid any attention to it. OK, because it was the zeitgeist. No one was listening. Everyone was doing this. It turns out later we now know that the CIA was promoting Jackson Pollock. Uh, but this is this is the type of uh, conflict that we had during this, the 20th century. The Italians were in many ways the only country that remained true to the traditions, the, the traditions of the West, all the way up to Gasparo today with his uh, the the uh, success de scandal of this uh, portrait. Ah, I mean, yes, uh, Gasparo, friend. Giovanni Gasparo is, is my friend also. Yeah, yes, I, I know him. This, Very good this, painter. This is, this is a, a, a continuity that the Italians have maintained that no other country can talk about. I mean, the, 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 the unago I, 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 I have a grandson who wanted to study art and he studied at Temple University in Philadelphia, which is my mm. alma mater. And I told mm. him, I said, take Anagoni's take Anagoni's manifesto and put that into your application. And he did, and he got a full scholarship because he did that. Because well, this was the, the, the central tradition. The Italians have maintained a, a fidelity to this tradition that no other country in the world has maintained. Yeah, and this is why also uh, Italians, uh, we, we are considered... Uh, you know, the, the one that are uh, not modern, uh, that uh, we are always uh, uh, back on the, on this. Uh, but it's the same for music. Uh, I studied with the uh, conductor, former conductor of the Sistine Chapel Choir, and he was always accused, of, oh, you are still in the past, and now we have to go in the future. The music should be like this, like that. And, of course, one of the names always came, he, he was the one of Schoenberg. And right. in your book, uh, I think it's very interesting what you say about Schoenberg and the origin of the dodecaphonic do system, because uh, he basically borrowed the system from another person, uh, uh, Hauer. And uh, and you say something also uh, continuing on this line of the of the sexual reading. Uh, you say that uh, if if for Wagner the analogy was uh, adultery. Uh, for Hauer, that is the one that uh, developed the system, uh, it was a sort of uh, cenobitic celibate, celibacy. Right. Uh, so, uh, can you explain why you you uh, what you mentioned from for this? Yeah, because there's no there's no uh, union of notes anymore. Uh, it, 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 what we want is harmony, which is the perfect union of two notes. What Wagner gave us was adultery, which is basically the chromatic, never and never ending sexual intercourse. Yes. And he sexualized the orchestra to the point where uh, Josef Matthias Hauer, when he went to hear the orchestra, he got ill. He got physically ill. And so he, uh, he went in the opposite direction, the complete opposite direction, which is basically no harmony. These notes will never get together. They are going to remain completely isolated in their cenobitic cells. And that's all there is. That's it. And it was a, a reaction uh, that Aristotle would have said is missed the target on one side just as much as Wagner missed the target on the other side. But there, there's one there's one note I wanted to bring up here. I was in a band in Germany uh, during the 1970s, and the only guy with musical talent in that band was my friend Heiner, 
who went to the Robert Schumann Institute in Dusseldorf, where he studied classical music. Guess what he learned at the Robert Schumann Institute? He learned 12-tone music. Why did he learn 12-tone music? Because Germany was a conquered country. It had been conquered by the United States, and the social engineering in Germany was under the control of the Jews, and the Jews then promoted Schoenberg as Schoenberg's version of the 12-tone system as punishment for what the Germans did in World War II. I told him this to his face. He didn't believe me. He thought I was a conspiracy theorist. And then the story came out that the CIA was promoting 12-tone music. They were promoting the summer sessions seminars at Donau Eschigen. The, it was CIA money that allowed these people to take over the Zudwest Rundfunk and promote 12-tone music. So it was a weaponization of music that was used to punish the German people. So I, I want to uh, tell you, ask you something. You In your book, you say that the abolition of natural law bring to tyranny. Uh, right. And uh, and uh, so th this is, the, uh, this is a, a condemnation of uh, Nazism, fascism, uh, or communism, all, all of this uh, political movement. Well, insofar as they abrogate the moral law, because the moral law is the natural order. I'm saying there is a natural order to music. There's a natural order to human yeah. behavior. There's a natural order to the universe. And the word we use for all of these is logos. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if you violate the logos of human sexuality, there is going to be a response. And the response is going to be overregulation in one mm -hmm. sense. Uh, so everything, you have to sign consent forms now every time you go out with a, uh, on, on a girl, on a, with a girl on a date. Uh, you have all these sexual harassment suits. You have the whole Harvey Weinstein thing as a kind of overreaction to the breakdown of natural sexual morality. Uh, Hauer was exactly the same thing. It was the tyrannical reaction to uh, Wagnerian sensuality. Once, if you have this Wagnerian sensuality, it's going to lead to anarchy. That's precisely what happened in Schoenberg's life. Okay, Schoenberg uh, became a Christian. He was a Lutheran. Uh, he married a woman, and they were living the uh, La Boheme, uh, the Bohemian lifestyle in Vienna. And as a result, his wife had an affair with an artist. Uh, 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 Schoenberg found, found out about the affair. He was mortally wounded by this affair and he broke off all relations with his wife and he broke off all relations with Christianity. He reverted to being a Jew and now as a Jew, he was going to punish Christian Europe. And the punishment was Moses and Aaron, his 12-tone opera, which he inflicted on the German people as punishment for his wife's adultery. But uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, probably, and this uh, maybe I want to uh, hear uh, Dr. Yanakone first, uh, that uh, um, the process that was uh, uh, brought forward by Schoenberg uh, was for a kind of music that was more and more far from the people uh, taste and listening because uh, uh, it's a music that is very difficult to listen. I mean, even myself that I'm a trained musician, I have to say, frankly, I, I, I cannot stand for very long listening to dodecaphonic music. And so uh, in uh, in the past century, the first part of the 19th of the 20th century, there was also the, the beginning of uh, a new kind of uh, music for the people that uh, will be uh, then the rock and roll and then uh, that will develop. So uh, also in that case, uh, this music was uh, not music uh, that uh, um, bring to people some good values, or but also on the side of uh, this kind of destructive uh, process. You know? So how do you rate the influence of uh, uh, rock music on the way you know, we developed uh, and, uh, in, uh, in Italy, but also internationally? Well, that's a, that's a very difficult uh, uh, question because we have uh, uh, various stages. But uh, the, the first one is uh, that, and uh, uh, Michael Jones uh, uh, 
speaks about, uh, uh, writes about this. Uh, after Schoenberg, uh, the music uh, uh, had the rock uh, uh, in some way returned to the, the tonal uh, system, to the diatonic system, to music that had uh, a beginning, a middle, and, and, a, and an end, and a catharsis. For some uh, years, uh, this was uh, the, 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 the music, the rock music. Um, but after, uh, from 80s, I think, and 90s, uh, the situation is uh, completely um, changed because now we have uh, an hypnotic music uh, that uh, um, that uh, has uh, uh, compressed uh, uh, the voices uh, and the sounds uh, to uh, two or three uh, modules, to uh, two or three uh, uh, kind of, uh, of sound. And uh, I, I am speaking about uh, mass music, not uh, uh, the, the high music. Uh, so uh, the situation now, uh, about uh, uh, the, the situation about uh, uh, mass music, I think that is uh, uh, very, very, uh, in some way, uh, uh, tragic, <laughs> because uh, uh, there there is too much music, and so uh, we have no um, more music. If you go to an airport, if you if you go uh, to uh, a shop, uh, if you go shopping or uh, if you um, work uh, in, uh, in, a, in a street, uh, you always are immersed, um, in, uh, sub submerged in some way in the uh, in the music. And too much music is no music. Uh, so I. I think that this is the situation now. Um, yeah. I, uh, and and I, I want to uh, ask to, to the Dr. Jones uh, one thing. Do you think that rock music is the is the reaction to Schoenberg or is the continuation of Schoenberg? Uh, for, for, first of all, just to mention uh, uh, Mario's point of yeah. too much music. It, it reminded me of Brian Eno. Brian Eno wrote a piece yeah. called uh, Music for Airports or something like that. Mm. It's seven hours long. It's Wagnerian. It's it's Wagnerian. There, you, you drift along from one emotion to another. There's yes. no beginning. There's no middle and end. It's just one mood after another that goes on forever and ever. They play it in the underpass at Chicago's O'Hare Airport. It's uh, with neon lights on the top. But to get to get back to the development, I mean, uh, what what happened at this point is was summarized by George Antile, who said, uh, if we had to listen to one more piece by Va uh, I'm sorry, one more piece by Schoenberg, we all would have committed suicide. So it was with great rejoicing uh, that we, we celebrated when the first jazz band arrived in Paris in 1919. Now, what you have here is Dionysian music, uh, no question about it, but the emphasis is switched from the chromaticism to the rhythm. And the rhythm now becomes the vehicle of the Dionysian. And that was jazz uh, was refreshing in that regard. It was simple in terms of the melodies and the, the tonality and the harmonies and everything else. And the, the rhythm was really compelling. And it really got you tapping your feet and you wanted to jump up and move to it. And that was the beginning of that eventually led to rock and roll yeah, yes. in the 50s, which was when when jazz became too esoteric with people like Charlie Parker uh, in the 50s, the mood switched to rock and roll. And you had somebody like Bill Haley and the Comets causing riots in Germany when they had their their conference. So it got simpler as time went on. And then it became more and more Dionysian, uh, the simpler it got. And so the culmination of that development was Woodstock, which was a full-blown Dionysian festival. It was exactly what Nietzsche and Thomas Mann had predicted, a Dionysian festival. Uh, and music and intoxication were an integral part of that, that Dionysian festival. That led to uh, other developments, rap music, which is no longer music. It's a kind of chanting uh, because uh, we, we, you're right, Mario, we have too much music. And so the industry had to keep up by constantly producing new stuff and they ran out of ideas. They yes. just lost their ideas. 
And so they produce this kind of uh, hypnotic, rhythmic uh, type of musical mayhem that is just more simpler, more and more brutal as time goes on. And I, I think, uh, uh, yes, I want to follow up with Dr. Yanacone because I know you, you have done some studies about this uh, like trap uh, or uh, modern uh, kind of, uh, yes, yeah, so modern kind. So how this relate with the, what we said before, do you think? How this relate to these modern developments? Well, I, I can say this, that uh, I think that the uh, rhythm and the sound in contemporary mass music have been subjected to uh, something kind of dreadful treatment, which has transformed it into something deeply robotic, mechanical and uh, uh, dehumanized. Uh, most voices uh, um, that uh, should be the instrument of uh, individuality, uh, I am uh, speaking about the voices of the artists, have been reduced uh, uh, to, uh, as I said uh, before, two or three uh, timbers, um, two or three uh, models, um, not allowing um, to display uh, the, the richness uh, of possibilities available to uh, to singers. Um, in other uh, words, personality has been up uprooted. Uh, the uh, personality of this artist is, has been uprooted. And uh, uh, the reason behind all this, I think, is the guarantee, uh, to guarantee the absolute interchangeability of performers uh, accomplishing uh, so accomplishing the two dream of the market that uh, is uh, uh, to make the music a commodity uh, so uh, in this scenario i am i am speaking about uh, well trap music and this kind of music uh, uh, house music uh, the artists in this scenario the artists are disposable uh, within uh, a maximum uh, two, I think, or three years. Uh, and uh, all the songs have the similar rhythms, sounds, and regiment, and, uh, and, uh, and, and timbers. Uh, and because uh, th they use also um, digital means to flat, uh, in some way, the, the, the sound, and uh, this represents, I think, the uh, true reification of, of music in modern time, the commodification, we can say, of, uh, of, of sound. Uh, in, in the golden age of rock and pop uh, too, uh, the situation was not so tragic. Mm. So uh, this uh, is this what I, I observe, and I would, I would like to, to her uh jones uh, michael jones opinion uh, about this but if yeah, and also we don't forget that, that in the like 40s 50s we we have uh, commercial music we may call even in united states uh, and our, uh, in, in italy too but we have uh, i don't know gershwin or jerome kern uh, cole porter i mean this was they were very good uh, musician and oh, they yeah. really know uh, what they, they were but, but then, yes, our, our years, our years, yes. yeah, 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 of course, the, the, our development was uh, uh, different. Uh, I want to, uh, I don't know, uh, Dr. Johnson, want to comment on uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Yeah. Yanakone said. Yes, I, uh, what, what you're talking about here is the rise of the recording, recorded music, uh, yeah. over, the, over the course of the 20th century. Uh, so this was brought home to me when my uh, my mother-in-law died and we went to the house and had to empty the house out. And what we discovered in the basement were all these musical instruments. There was an accordion, uh, a violin, a guitar, uh, and a mandolin, two mandolins actually. Yeah. And I had I had been married to my wife for 40 years. I had known her years before that. I had never seen one person in this house play a musical instrument, but they were all there. At some point, they, they, they just stopped playing. And I understand why they stopped playing, because you're competing with a recording. 
and the recording is always more powerful than anything you're going to come up with on your, on your own instrument. Yeah. So what happened here, uh, the reaction, uh, we, we could have known the reaction. Ray Fun Williams wrote a book called uh, National Music. It was a series of uh, lectures that he gave at Bryn Mawr College in Philadelphia uh, during the 1930s. And he said, all music is folk music, ultimately. And it, it just as uh, Bach spoke German, he wrote German music. And what we saw during this period of time was the return of real folk music. So I took those instruments. I gave my son, my youngest son, the violin. I took the mandolin and we started playing Irish music. It was the return of the repressed. We were tired. Everyone was tired. I'm talking about right around 1999, 2000, around that period of time, around 20 years ago. Everyone was tired of listening to recorded music. And I'm saying even classical recorded music. We were tired of it. We, we decided, let's make our own music. And there was a pub here in town, and we, I played Irish music every Monday night at that pub for about 16 years. Uh, and that th that changed too. But I mean, this was a point where the people decided to go back to the roots and and, and the roots are folk music. And they, they discovered the roots of their own ethnic identity. So one of the, so there was a, a professional musician from Grand Haven, which is about a hundred miles north of here. And it, he lived in a community where all these people had big families and he was wondering about music. I said, start playing Irish music. And for once, Someone listened to me and they did. And it's amazing to get back to your idea of children and music. It's amazing what a child can do with music where you have these, these children who can barely talk. They're like three and four years old and they're playing Irish melodies on, on the tin whistle. It's amazing what children can do with music. And that's what he did. And that has uh, continued to this day in reaction to, the degeneracy of, of recorded music, which is just, you can't listen to it. It's, it's aggression. You kind of, uh, people go by in their cars. You feel as if you're being attacked by the music they're playing in their cars. Now, this was the reaction to that. And uh, taking from what Dr. Jones has said, I want to remind you about what we have Monday. Uh, our musical is the child music in early childhood uh, with uh, me and Dr. Nicholas Bannon, that is the author of a book uh, on this topic uh, published by Oxford University Press, then Professor Zinfira Polos, that is a very famous Canadian uh, conductor of a very famous uh, ch uh, children choir. And then Dr. Erimas Velishka, that is a musicologist and music pedagogue from Lithuania. Then uh, to conclude uh, this, um, uh, uh, to conclude this program, I want to uh, do like this. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, show a question from one of our listeners for Dr. Jones, and uh, he uh, may, may answer. And uh, then uh, I will uh, ask Dr. Jones another thing. So Dr. Jones, one of our uh, readers say, do we have to go back to the roots such as folk or classical music to rescue logos? Or do we have a way to move forward with logos? The way you move forward is going back to the roots. So you have to, in order to move forward, you have to go back to the ethnic roots, which are the basis for classical music. Uh, I think that's what people are doing. And you can do that with your children. Now, a, a, Bach, the Bach family is a great cultural achievement, okay? It's a great cultural achievement. Uh, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach is like the top of a mountain. But what's below Bach is all of these folk people making folk music. What you see in Ireland was a, a, a tradition where they never reached uh, the pinnacle with someone like Bach because the English... Uh, banned musical instruments for a period of time in Ireland. They never had the cultural autonomy to do this. So we have to, the, the surest way, the simplest way for you to introduce Logos to young children is to teach them how to play music. And the simplest music that you can teach them is folk music. That's why it's so important to make a start with folk music. That's why uh, the, the, the fiddle, the violin is a brilliant instrument in this regard, because you can start off playing folk melodies and you can go all the way up to the most sophisticated classical music there is. Uh, unlike the guitar, which cannot make that, that transition only in, in very specific instances. 
That's why I, the violin is important. I remember when that uh, when we met in Italy some years ago, you have a you had a, a banjo with you. No, it was a mandolin. <laughs> a mandolin. A mandolin. <laughs> <laughs> Amanda. And uh, I, I want to, I want uh, still to show to uh, people uh, the book we talk in this program, Dionysus Rising by Dr. E. Michael Jones. Uh, very, very interesting book, The Birth of Cultural Revolution Out of the Spirit of Music. Really a book that has some controversial points, but a book that is really worthy to uh, read. And uh, you can find it in English in the website of uh, fidelitypress.org or even in Italia, in Italian, published by FDF, FDF Edizioni. Before we conclude, I want to ask Dr. Jones uh, to say a few words about uh, Logos Rising, that has a very similar title uh, to this one we discussed today. What, what is about what the people uh, would find in this Logos Rising? Well, I mean, you, we've already talked about Logos, and I, I, I've been struggling. We live in a world that denies the existence of Logos. It says that everything is a cultural a construct that's imposed by man. There's no ultimate reality, and so on and so forth. And so I've been working my way out of that swamp, out of that mess, for 40 years now, one way or the other. And the culmination of that work is Logos Rising, because it's the most abstract a uh, book that I've ever written because it's the history of metaphysics, which is the history of ultimate reality. And it's a history of everything. Okay. I mean, the, the, it's, it's the, res it's the response in many ways to my book, the Jewish revolutionary spirit, which is a history of anti logos, which begins with the Jews rejection of Jesus Christ. Uh, the, the rejection of Jesus Christ means the rejection of Logos. And when you reject Logos, you become revolutionaries. And that became the Jewish identity for the last 2000 years. This book goes, the Logos Rising goes back to the beginning of everything, everything, the beginning of the beginning, and talks about the rise of our understanding of order in a much more ab abstract and comprehensive way. Okay, so I want to uh, I repeat, uh, if you want, you can read the book by Dr. E. Michael Johnson. There are many controversial ideas, but certainly they are refreshing to, to have uh, some kind of different understanding about uh, certain topics and certain things. So uh, I'm now I'm going to conclude the program. I, I ask you to remain uh, one minute, uh, you two uh, online when I conclude so we can uh, we can greet each other well. So I want to thank Dr. E. Michael Jones at, uh, to, for his participation. And I want to thank also Dr. Mario Yannacone for his participation to this program. Thank you very much. You. And thank I you. hope I can see uh, our listener and our uh, audience in the next program that will be on Monday. So thank you very much and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.